<laughs> Hi, my name is Reverse Butcher, and I'm a VR artist and poet based in Melbourne, Australia. I have James Knight from the UK, Elizabeth Honer, better known as Girl Writer from the USA, and Chris Wen joining me also from Melbourne. We four are going to have a discussion about experimental li literature and international creative collaboration using XR and digital tools. The four of us worked together on a series of three digital events to celebrate the launch of my most recent book of visual poetry, which is an experimental genre of writing, otherwise known as VISPO. My book, Kaleidoscopic Erasures, was published by James Knight's small press, Steel Incisors, in February 2022. Live events, or traveling for promotional or performance tours, have been made unviable for many types of artists in the COVID-19 era. I had to think really seriously about how I wanted to promote the book as to a wide an audience as possible in a clever, safe, and affordable way. How could I thoughtfully uphold the duty of care to make any live environment as safe as possible for an audience or performer and legally abide by any and all restrictions put in place to help control the ongoing public health emergency? I also wanted to look at how I could use some of the creative VR tools and environments that I love to push the boundaries of what was already happening in the experimental poetry scene. I also wanted to expand my existing audience, which is almost evenly split across poetry and VR art, by introducing my VR audience to experimental poetry and the poets to VR. So how do you even launch a book in VR? The short answer is I had a wild idea, I asked for a little help from my friends, and we figured it out as we went along. To try and reach the maximum audience possible, James and I decided that we would schedule a Twitter Spaces Q&A event first to reach out to the large and very supportive VizPo scene that finds its home on Twitter. We introduced the more experimental and immersive VR events in this audio-only session. Then, I built an immersive VR exhibition space and populated it with the VizPo works from the Kaleidoscopic Erasures book which were also works all designed to be looked at, not read aloud. I built it for use in VR chat so that this could be used as a meeting place to experience and discuss the art. But this immersive experience was still limited to those who already had a VR headset. To make sure that it was accessible regardless of VR citizenship, Elizabeth came on board to help shoot all of the A-roll for the exhibition space from inside VR using VRC's virtual camera system. She also taught me how to use VRC's cameras so that I could shoot, perform, and edit all the sections where I was discussing the art myself for the guided video tour or VTube. Elizabeth also attended and participated the live VR book launch event. And together, we were able to shoot the event with two cameras from within the VR space with the live participants from all over the world. It was a bit hectic, as she was one of the participants, and I was running the live tour of the VR art gallery. But between the two of us, we came up with enough, uh, more than enough, in-game camera uh, coverage for me to edit together a compelling guided video tour, so that those without VR headsets could still participate. Girl Rider is an incredible VR artist in her own right but she also has a lot of live performance experience, camera and live streaming knowledge. Composer Chris Wen and I go way back, having performed and collaborated in and around Melbourne with experimental music and poetry performances and also on theatre projects. Chris also performed at my last pre-COVID book launch live. He also composed the soundtrack for the very first immersive live theatre work that I collaborated on in Melbourne. It was an honour and a lovely echo that he also created the soundtrack for the first immersive VR art gallery I've ever made. James Knight is not only a publisher and a great supporter of VizPo practitioners, but a celebrated poet in his own right with a substantial skill, knowledge, and passion across VizPo, performance, and experimental poetry. I could not have found better collaborators. So that should be enough of a setup and enough about me. So let's ask these clever people some clever questions. <laughs> so we'll start with you, James, if that's all right. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Fabulous. <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you introduce yourself and t tell us a little bit about your own practice? 
Sure. So I'm James Knight, and for many years I've, I've written poetry and made art, presumably um, uh, pre predominantly digital art. Um, and I suppose in recent years I've focused largely on making visual poetry. So um, poetry, which is designed to be looked at, or another way is to see it as art that is designed to be read. Um, and I've experimented on um, a number of different projects to do with visual poetry, both singly um, and also in collaboration with a number of other people. Um, and I, I, I suppose that the, the lifeblood of this comes from a, a passion for, for, for the scene as I see it and for, for what's going on around me. Um, you know, I'm unashamed in saying that I've, I've fed off that scene and although I've, I'm creating a body of work which I think is quite distinctive, um, it absolutely doesn't exist in a vacuum and it couldn't exist without other people like you and, and other practitioners of visual poetry. Um, and, it, and so then it was a logical step to go from focusing predominantly on my own work to um, publishing and celebrating other people's. Uh, and, I've, and I've said um, on, on a number of occasions that for me, the, the one of the main joys of running this tiny visual poetry publishing venture, Steel Incisors, is the fact that I get to immerse myself um, in other people's work and celebrate their work and revel in it. Um, so that's what I'm about. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, is there anything else about Steel Incisors you'd like to share with us before we go on to maybe a, de a brief definition of Vispo? Or do you have any, like, yeah, you, you've yeah, talked well, a little I, bit I about suppose, it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I've not been doing it for very long. Um, the first book was, was only published... Um, last year, I think last May I think it was in fact, the, the anthology, I put out an anthology of apocalyptic visual poetry um, and then after that two, two further titles last year, it's picked up a lot this year, I, I mean I, I, I decided from the off that I wasn't going to try to compete with some other small publishers who put out an incredible um, quantity of work because I thought um, that's just not fair on anybody because um, I want to be able to do justice to the few books I think I can manage. So for me, it, it's, it's, it's not a big thing. It's never going to be a big thing in terms of the catalogue. Um, but it is all about nurturing what I think are distinctive voices in visual poetry. So I'm particularly interested in visual poetry that maybe bucks some of the existing trends of visual poetry or asks some questions about visual poetry and what it can be and maybe poses a few cheeky challenges to what you might call the mainstream of visual poetry, if that exists, which is debatable. And, and just for those who are tuning in and who might not know what vi uh, visual poetry is, can you give like maybe just a, a brief definition as you see it? I know that it's, yeah, it's so a diverse it's field. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, it's so, it's so, it's so vast, it's almost impossible to, to define. Um, but I suppose I'd say it, visual poetry is um, a medium which encourages us to look at words on a page, not just for their meaning, but for their shapes and their disposition on the page. And it also will often incorporate pictorial elements, um, which we are encouraged to read, perhaps symbolically, or perhaps to read as a language in their own right. And for me, it's the, the difficulties of defining visual poetry and its diversity um, and, its, and the way it kind of, um, our understanding of it is constantly having to change. That is exactly what makes it exciting for me, that it's an art form that can't be pinned down too readily and that people can have disagreements about what counts as visual poetry, you know, and what are the limits of visual poetry and what are the potentials of visual poetry. Um, and so it's one of these things you kind of, you kind of know it when you see it. Um, although you don't always know it when you see it, because mm -hmm. a lot of it is to do with the way you look, you know? So, so I think, you know, from, you know, if you go way back, Marcel Duchamp, I think, really established the notion that a work of art is defined not by an inherent quality necessarily, but by how we look at it 
I think the same to a large extent is true of visual poetry. You know, and there's a lot of material, published material you could look at and think, yes, I, I consider that to be visual poetry because I read it in a certain way. Whereas other people might think, well, no, it's, um, it's a work of art or it's, um, it's a collage or, or whatever it might be. I agree. I think if somebody says, that's well, not a poem, a then you're on the right track. That's not poetry. Mm, is it? Really? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. That's where it gets interesting. It doesn't it? Yeah, I'll fight you over it. Um, okay, I'm yeah. going to um, bring Chris up to the, uh, the mic, if he's ready, and ask Chris some questions, our delightful composer. Um, if, uh, if you'd like to maybe introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your practice. Sorry, my mute button disappeared. Um, so, about me, uh, I'm a sound designer for primarily for live performance and theatre. Um, so I have worked in independent, independent theatre in Melbourne for most of my life now, um, probably about a 25-year odd career of, of making noises for theatre, as I call it. Um, and uh, a sound designer lives in, in a kind of strange space between kind of a composer and artist uh, and, and kind of facilitator, I guess. Um, you have to kind of establish a, a relationship with an audience that doesn't yet exist um, because you're creating the work before the work actually happens, uh, which to me made the the transition to starting to work um, in uh, these extended reality type situations um, easier, I think, um, because there's still a relationship to build with an audience. Um, so in particular during the last couple of years it's become a possibility for me previously we didn't um, have that kind of technological relationship with performance that, but now that's, that's kind of changed um, so I've worked internationally but not simultaneously on multiple continents. <laughs> well, now you can say you have because <laughs> yeah. we have yeah. had people turn up to this thing all, uh, all from different, different countries. So the future mm. is now. Um, mm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience live streaming music? Because I know during the pandemic you did do some uh, sets that were sort of, I think, improvisational in nature yeah. or uh, yeah. on YouTube. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Um, so I found... During the pandemic, I think as as we all have done, I missed that connection, that that kind of moment of performance where something can go spectacularly right or spectacularly wrong. You know, <laughs> the, the possibility of of public failure, I guess, um, and so. I figured out how to hook up the, the studio you can kind of see behind me um, and send that out into the world in, in almost real time. Um, because that, that kind of intimacy with distance that you have as a, in performance you know, you are you are bearing your soul in a way to an audience of complete strangers. Um, it became interesting to me um, because I was able to bring people into my home and into my creative process without. Uh, without being able to actually physically be there. Um, and, and there is that similar kind of intimacy in, in live performance. 
you're, you're distant but separated. You're you're sharing something that you know all your technology could fail. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and it often did. Um, <laughs> yes. And it often does in, in live performance. Um, so having, having that creative outlet, having that ability to put my thoughts and my voice out in a, in a creative fashion to the world in this kind of strange strange place that is YouTube. <laughs> um, well, I really enjoyed listening to them. Um, uh, so uh, out of selfish, um, selfish uh, desire, I'll, I'll make sure to share the link to where that was happening and, and the, the previous ones you have still up there because they were really interesting experiments, I think. And of course, nothing short of what we have come to expect from you, Chris. Um, but speaking of, of technology that may or may not fail, that's a really sort of interesting uh, vignette to this idea of um, your studio. I, I was wondering what kind of equipment you've used to compose uh, and play and share the music that you've been doing uh, in the pandemic. Sure. Um, so I primarily work uh, in Ableton Live, and I have a controller, a push controller for that, just beside me on the desk here. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the the brain of the, the, the setup. Um, and it's a kind of hybrid um, digital in the box, in the, in, in the laptop thing. And um, as you can see behind me, there's bits and pieces of, of equipment um, and a big rack of stuff. All the uh, cables, yes. All the, all the cables. <laughs> all the cables. Yeah. Um, so, I mean... The, the other kind of significant thing for me in doing this was I was uh, I, I primarily a studio artist. Um, I have uh, worked with Ableton Live with uh, a band called Primitive Calculators um, who are kind of a, a very storied and kind of and foundational noise punk band here in, in Melbourne. They've, they've been in operation since... Um, I was born basically in, in the late seventies. Um, so, teaching myself to be a live artist from the comfortable comfortable confines of my studio was an interesting experiment. So I could take all the hardware and all the the software and all the techniques that I use um, and feed those back into the computer through live, and then into um, Open Broadcast Studio, OBS. Yeah. Um, which then spat everything out to, to YouTube. Um, and I quickly found out that uh, here in Australia we have limited bandwidth for that kind of stuff. Yes, that is the unique uh, challenge that we face. <laughs> um, which also combined with uh, the limitations of computer hardware resources um, and I'd have situations where you know my computer would be overheating the the um, I, I, I use a, a Mac laptop which is not primarily a, a uh, live digital media kind of thing people use PC much more than they use Mac um, so I would get Dropouts and um, strange digital glitching happening in the live stream um, where things would explode suddenly and come back and explode and come back. And, and that also became part of this experiment to, to work around the limitations. Yeah. Sometimes when we're given those kinds of limitations or, or restrictions, uh, the things that we come up with uh, might not be what we initially thought we would, but they end up being better and brighter because of these limitations that we're faced with. And, that, and that's how I definitely feel about what you've created for the Kaleidoscopics uh, Erasures VR Art Gallery. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to move on to Elizabeth and then we'll come back to you in a little bit. Are you ready, Elizabeth? Great. Ready. Hello. 
Hello. Hello. Um, I was hoping you could introduce yourself a little and tell us about your creative practice. I'm sure. My name is Elizabeth Honer. I am known on the internet as Girl Writer in various places. And my creative practice is taking the stuff in my head and getting it onto a piece of paper or a screen with any method necessary. And recently, the necessary methods have usually been digital, um, for example, with 2D animation, which is one of my preferred mediums. Um, you know, I'm, it's all digital. It's all on the computer, even though it is traditional 2D animation. But also through VR, being able to sculpt things in 3D, and then I get that nice cinematic feel with the camera that I just can't quit. Um, so those things are, I guess, of interest to me as far as my creative process. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with performing live uh, versus uh, photography or, or live streaming? Um, maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit about how those skills were transferable? Sure. Um, actually, it's interesting because the live streaming thing is um, not actually something I am so well versed in. That's a rather new thing because usually the nice thing about animation is you set your scene up, you get it the way you want, you hit render and you leave and then you come back and it's done. So there's no, there's no live action capturing of any material, which is what I thought I preferred. But I will say that with the tools that are available in VR, being able to like go around with a virtual camera, which you can modify to your liking and capture things that are happening in real time is really fun. And it reminds me a lot of like stage performance. It reminds me a lot of just being able to be on stage, see what's happening. I think, you know, Chris kind of alluded to this a little bit with just what's going to happen. Will it be a disaster? Or will it be amazing? And you just don't know until it's actually unfolding. And then it's, there's something very thrilling and terrifying about the split second decisions about what you capture and how you capture it. And do you dare try to recreate it or is it gone? That's an excellent answer. Um, well, uh, again, I'm going to ask a little bit about the equipment that you're using, um, and maybe if you want to describe your studio or workspace. I can see you're actually in it, so. I was going to say, if you want a tour, I can take this thing off and like, point it around <laughs> if you wish. I've basically got, I've got the PC, and I've got uh, various monitors. Here's one, and I'm talking to you on one, and then I, of course, have everyone's favorite, the VR headset, which, Yay. again, you, you cannot cannot live without no. um, and you hook everything up in various configurations to do whatever it is you're trying to do okay perfect um, I wondered if you could describe your technical and creative process um, while doing the a-roll shots for uh, the kaleidoscopic erasures VR art gallery guided video tour I would love to describe that because it was one of my favorite things <laughs> I basically just got to chase you around in your avatar <laughs> while you were pointing out various things and um, I will say one of the technical things that was so interesting to me that opposed to capturing, say, a, a live human or, say, things in physical space, an avatar has, in some ways, very limited expressiveness, but at the same time, it also captures such a presence of body and a presence of, you know, gesticular uh, sort of information. So a lot of the technical part of it was just saying or seeing okay, so if I'm composing this shot, you know, how, how are you standing in front of me? Or if we, we were at the live event and there were about, you know, 13, 14 people there. Oh, how are, how's everyone reacting to this? And can you tell by, you know, this part of the body, which is like the tracks, you know, are they looking up or are they pointing at this thing? And are they, you know, you, you can just kind of sense a way that you can capture sort of what it is that is interesting about the piece that they are actually gesturing towards. And, not again it was the limitations thing not having say specific facial information or say not having you know certain stance information was actually really interesting because then you can you're free to focus on other things um particularly the artwork that was actually one of the funnest things was just seeing how people would stand around the artwork and then are you going to be this close or are you going to be this far away to get the full picture and are you looking at who's interested in this specific thing and why are they interested in it and catching that piece of the conversation. Like, it's just, I mean, it really is sort of stage like where there's, you know, beats and moments passing by and you're able to like see the motion of things being discussed within those. And I just think that's, again, very, very interesting and very cool. 
Well, you really did help me capture uh, that live event. And uh, what you also did was this idea of capturing parts of the conversation. I often used, like, detach the audio from sections if the video wasn't sort of so good on what I was doing or, or you know, the, it didn't capture the moment quite the way you did. I could swap and change, just like editing together a documentary or a, or a live event with multiple cameras. So it was absolutely invaluable, and I'm really grateful that you helped there. Um, oh, thank you. I'm going to uh, swap to Chris again and ask him a question. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the obvious differences a little bit about uh, performing in front of a live audience uh, and a digital audience. Um, the most immediate difference is that uh, there is latency. Huh. So... Um, you do the thing, and it's a period, particularly in Australia, <laughs> it's a period of, of some seconds before any re any reaction comes back. In in kind of traditional live performance settings, you can see or hear or feel the audience in real time. You know you. You know if they love you and you know if they hate you. Whereas, you know, there's there's that delay. Um, as you do the thing, it gets processed, uploaded. They download and process it themselves. Their reaction is uploaded. You know, there's, it's back and forth. Um, and I found particularly in... In making live music, it creates this kind of half world where um, there is constant uncertainty, uh, and and that kind of liminal space was very interesting from a kind of philosophical, artistic perspective. Um, And also you find, you know, the, the physicality of reactions doesn't happen. You have textual reactions. We have people that are in the chat using the kind of truncated speech that you use in, in live chat. They're using emoji. Um, how do I, with my, my hands on knobs and, and um, running back and forth across the studio, keep that interaction going um, so in, in, in my live streams I would have my heavily processed voice on this microphone uh, and so it, the, the conversation became part of the music that was being produced uh, which was also kind of fascinating yeah, I, I remember listening to that. It was sort of almost like um, part radio DJ, part performer, part, part poet. There were some very poetic interludes that sort of came through over the music that you were you were building in those live sessions, and it was all really um, compelling, I thought. Um, but speaking of, of the great technical hurdles that can be reached, would you say latency was the main one that you had, or was there any other sort of barriers that you faced um, trying to, to reach digital or mixed reality audiences? Um, to, to make live performance in the real world, there's kind of a whole infrastructure that goes into it. And um, so you have, you know, have promotion and you have um, you know, publicity, whatever that is. Uh, you, particularly during my lockdown period I'm not a terribly good self-promoter uh. so that that kind of outreach was was difficult for me but then there's also and I think this really is a compelling problem for uh, something as new as XR um, the access to to the hardware the access to the computing power that's required um is quite radically different for different groups of people um uh, particularly in in the context of 
collaborating with you, mm. um, I have not yet been able to afford the the, the hardware that's required. You know, I don't have a headset, no. so I am particularly in this in this space with my um, my work with you that that I am really imagining. What is, what is going to be the audience experience? How do I translate my knowledge of um, space, spatiality, um, uh, the nuances of voice and bodies in a place? Yes, I, I remember because uh, when we were uh, building the, the set for the, the gallery, I think I sent you some still images, but that definitely does not compare. And it wasn't actually until I had already put your music into the gallery that you we were in a, a point where there were few enough restrictions for you to come to my apartment and put yeah. on a headset and have a look. So um, I, I do appreciate that uh, VR citizenship, you know, this idea of, of you know, are you able to access a headset or not is, is certainly a, a big factor in these kinds of things, which was why it was so important to make sure that there was a documentary or like a, a VTube version of this so that people who don't have a headset or who haven't been exposed to VR before could um, could participate in that way. But yeah, I, I'm hoping that VR becomes a lot more accessible. And with things like the Quest 2 that Elizabeth is using, and I, I have one of those as well, they're standalone and, and more and more things are becoming accessible. But you're absolutely right, there's a huge divide. I think that's one of the big issues facing uh, mixed reality at this point. But it, it's not different to any form of, of, kind of new or innovative performance. Um, you you have audiences who kind of are almost like early adopters you know, in, in any new kind of art form. The people who know that it exists and have access to it are the first to spread it further. And, um, you know, film is a great example. All digital art. Yeah. Um... And for me, at least, the when I make work for theatre, um, I'm not generally in the theatre space until the very last minute. I have to imagine what that space is going to be like. So that process of thinking through what something will be and how it works with the this end product that hasn't happened yet made that transition easier for me, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I think that you do have the unique skill to to build an imaginary world within your, your work before the, the set is built, regardless of whether it's on a physical stage or, in this case, a digital one. Um, so, again, thank you. Um, can I just... Sorry, can I just ask... Chris, oh, yeah, please. Yeah, that was really interesting what you were saying just there, Chris. I, I was wondering, when you were talking about having to um, work without having necessarily visited the venue yet... Um, and not know exactly what it would be like in that venue. Have there been occasions when you've, when you've, um, when you've composed something, and then you've got to the venue and thought, "Hang on, actually, this isn't right," um, because for whatever to do with the acoustics or the, you know, um, the dimensions or the shape of the venue or whatever, it it, it hasn't worked. Um, I would say that in any show that I've worked on, there has been that moment where you realise that, and, and even in spaces that I actually know very, very well that I've worked in before, the particular combination of what the performer is doing, what the, the, the text is doing, what other things are happening on stage, e even a shift in lighting can, can make something just not work in that moment. On the other hand, you get these these incredible and beautiful and powerful moments of kind of serendipity where it all comes together in a moment. And that that's kind of the precarity of collaborating in live performance. 
you you don't know what's going to happen and then suddenly it is absolutely compelling and unlike anything else in the world. I remember um, too, you've been using technology, sorry, to, um, to f- sort of interact with some of these challenges since the, like the very beginning. Um, and I remember the show you did called The Trouble with Harry, uh, which do you want to just maybe fill the others in on that? So um, The Trouble with Harry was a show in the Melbourne Festival, um, I've got the date now, 2017, I think. Um, where we we had a text, um, The Trouble with Harry by Lachlan Philpott. Lachlan is uh, um, quite uh, established and, and uh, well-respected queer writer for the stage. Um, so we had that text uh, and we had a space. We'd been given the main hall of the Northgate Town Hall, which is a sort of late 19th century colonial edifice um, all moulded plaster and I think that the ceiling is about 15 metres high it's wide wood panelling plaster cavernous space and we got in there and we realised that the actors voices couldn't be heard we were, we were kind of privileged to, to to um, get in quite early in the process, but it was so resonant and so all the hard surfaces were making voices reflect so much that it became impossible to hear the text, which was very clipped and nuanced and and overlapping. Um, Because the reverb would just just cover the, the words. So we had to get the actor's voice to the audience's ears without losing the dynamics of live performance. And I kept thinking that the close, the, the closer you get a speaker to an audience, the less energy you have to put into getting that sound to the audience's ears because it's, it's closer, right? You, the more energy you put into the space, the more reverberant it becomes. So you put less energy, it becomes less reverberant. And I thought, well, can we put speakers beside every row? Can we put speakers beside every chair? Can we put speakers behind every head? <laughs> what do we call speakers that are attached to people's heads? Headphones. <laughs> Headphones. <laughs> so so um, I had this possibility to create a work for headphones that also could use the dynamics of the space. So there were speakers outside but also inside as it were um and as, as i'm sure anyway wears headphones knows they're not entirely perfect they don't close out the whole world so you can have sound that bleeds in and you could also create by bouncing sound off the walls sound that bleeds out of the building I just think your approach to, to solving that, that technical hurdle was, was such a, a clever one. And it's, it's, to me, it was, you know, the very beginning of sort of like a, a mixed reality because you were creating this soundscape and, and this, this um, way of expressing very nuanced emotion in a space that otherwise would have not, you know, failed at that, um, despite its grandeur. Um, so I, I, I know that's a bit of a tangent, but I just, I always, um, I, that's one of the things I think about when I think about your inventiveness and it, I think it applies to the way we've done this because it brings to mind this digital world building that, you know, you're so, uh, skilled at. Um, I'm going to ask an Elizabeth another question and move on if that is okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, I wondered uh, how you arrived at VR as a creative medium and what makes you so passionate about it. Okay, so I arrived at VR through pure laziness, honestly, because when you are a 2D animator and you want a cinematic feel, it means you have to draw the same thing over and over and over again to sort of get the idea of a camera moving around the thing. And I thought, can I make it once? 
and then have a camera just move around the thing and I'll figure out characters at some point. But that was sort of the idea. Um, I also had a friend, Arthur, who uh, continually asked me over a span of months when I was going to get VR and I thought maybe I should look into it. So um, I did and I have not looked back. But the thing that makes me so passionate about it is I, I, I wish I could explain to people who I... I Chris, again, you like alluded to this, but haven't had the opportunity to experience it for whatever reason. But the sense of presence that you get when you're in VR is just, it's stunning. It's really stunning to be standing with, I mean, groups of avatars that may look nothing like the human body and still feel like you are standing in the midst of a group of people from everywhere, but you're in your room. It is a wonderful, wonderful way to have an outreach to the world and to bring the world into your own space. And I really love it. And from an artistic point of view, um, I, you know, I'm so used to working within the frame of a camera, which is sort of a very big comfort zone for me. I, I like the idea of the information that is being conveyed, the information that is being left out so you can bring it in later through these sorts of movements. I think all that is very interesting to me. And then you stand in VR and the whole thing's gone. And now you're just experiencing everything in space as it is. And it, I mean, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about how you were describing Vizpo earlier, or just, you know, I know that it is a very vast way to describe a lot of things, but something that struck me was you're talking about taking something that may have been textual at one point, maybe not, but now it is, it's an image and it is experienced all at once. And I think that is a similar way to how I experience things in VR when there's a piece of work that is created that I would usually have a camera tell the story and that's part of what the story is. But now if you're in VR, you are in control of your experience of how you are going to experience this piece of work. You know, it's much more sculptural in that way. And I am continually fascinated by the tension between the medium of 2D and 3D and how they can complement each other, how they can't, what's appropriate where. Um, those things speak to me a lot. And I think VR is a great way to actually look at both. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I think, you know, you touched on something about how VR and Vispo have this, um, this spatial uh, quality to them. And, and, and that was definitely one of the things that actually sort of piqued me on to the idea of, of making poems in this particular way for that book was my VR art practice. All of a sudden, I couldn't think of text in, in a, without thinking about space. So it, it did really widen my, my approach. I've got one other question for you, though. Um, what kind of mixed reality or digital events excite you the most as an artist, and where do you see your creative practice developing next? Oh, man. Um... I, I mean, I'm still trying to even like look into the technique of what I wanted to do in the first place, which is, you know, make animation tools available to me through a more three-dimensional VR based situation. But I was thinking about this question and I thought specifically with like AR, with augmented reality, I'm really interested in the potential democratization of physical space. Like the idea that if, I don't know, I guess if you're going to like have something shown in a gallery, but there's only one space on a wall for the thing, then everyone's competing for that space. But what if that no longer matters? What if you can put your piece where someone else has their piece and it just depends on how, who wants to see it when? And what if you want to have a piece that's in the same physical space, but it's in conversation with the piece that was already there? That is super interesting to me. And I just wonder if we can just get away from having to compete for something as I frankly mundane in a way as physical space, just the actual physical space to put the thing that you want about conversation about. I think that there's a lot of creative potential and I'd love to see what those conversations look like. I agree. I think that's a really interesting avenue um, for, for future exploration. Um, James, I have a question for you if, if you're up for it. I'll, um, yeah, sure, I'll yeah. to you. Great. All right. Well, now that we've done those, um, those uh, digital launch events, I was wondering how effective you thought this style of a digital event was for launching a well, book. I think both, both of the events were quite novel. 
Um, and uh, so we had the, the Twitter Spaces event, first of all. Um, and although I've been a user of Twitter for, for a decade, I didn't really know anything about Twitter Spaces. Um, and so actually running an event uh, using that particular platform within a platform was really interesting and actually quite a revelation. Um, I, th I think that was really good because we, um, not only were people able to access it at the time, but obviously it's then available as a recording so people can click on the, on the tweets and then, and then access it. And quite a few people did subsequent to it. So um, people who didn't tune in live, so to speak, were still able to get to it later. And I think the fact that it was an audio recording and that it was on Twitter, I thought that was, that was really interesting because um, an, uh, the, the nice thing about an audio experience with no visual component is that you can do other things while you're listening to it. You know, it's like people who listen to audio books, you know, because you can, you can get on with other things. You can drive to work or whatever, or, you know, cook a meal. Um, and, and so that's actually quite interesting. I think I, I like the, the, you know, the possibility that you could be engaged in or listening to, experiencing a, a fascinating conversation about art and poetry whilst doing something else. So it's kind of, it's, a, it's kind of a low stakes experience in a way, you know? Um, and I think that 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 was really neat. I really liked that. Can I just then, interject? Course, I mean, the, sorry. Can yeah, I go ahead. Yeah. That point. It it reminds me of um, what Brian Eno first wrote about ambient music way way back with with um, music for airports. In in the liner notes, he said that ambient music is as ignorable as it is interesting. <laughs> and <laughs> and to create. Um, literature and visual art that does the same thing that we expect of music in a way is quite a powerful thing. Um, sorry, can continue. Yeah, no, 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 that's really, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, I, yeah. Oh yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. Because it was on Twitter and people um, primarily access Twitter through, you know, um, cell phones um, that kind of there's no possibility of an ivory tower is there when you're accessing something through a phone that sits in your pocket so I think that it, it just makes the whole thing feel accessible it goes to Elizabeth your idea about democratization you know it's about accessibility isn't it um, and so that that and so that was fantastic that was a great experience and that was really powerful I thought I mean the VR event was I mean that that was such an imaginative um, idea of yours, um, RVB, to to do it that way, and you know I'm a complete, um, you know well, I don't know anything about VR really. I know of it, um, but it's it's still it's still science fiction for me. I'm afraid I've never experienced it, um, much to my regret. Uh, I, I might put that right one day. But I thought that was a, that was a brilliant idea, and I was I was absolutely tickled pink by the by the video. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we had the, you know, two cameras there and the edit at the end, I thought was fantastic. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and that, again, that, that, that generates an interest as well, doesn't it? So that people, you can experience it in real time there, participate, interact, ask questions. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can be part of it. That is wonderful, isn't it? Um, and if you can't be there at that time, then you can you can tune in later and of course video is you know we're a very visual culture aren't we and and if there's something on youtube you know again it, it, it's something that's accessible and something that people feel they can they can get into you know and you know and, and the book's been selling well and I, and I think you know those those events have obviously been a big part of that because the whole the whole launch has been digital hasn't it you know the people wouldn't know about it without these digital media. In fact, it, it wouldn't have existed in the first place because we would never have made contacts and et cetera, et cetera. And the way we built the book and, you know, um, it was all it was all online. So um, the whole thing's been made possible thanks to that. Um, actually, that's true. We did meet on Twitter some years ago because of that uh, poetry uh, thread that had happened and it went on for, I don't know, what, a few months or whatever. And, and, and that was... Um, really my introduction to um, 
you know, I guess the international experimental poetry scene. And at that time, I was despairing. I was in Australia. I was feeling quite isolated. I, I couldn't... Um, I was having trouble connecting with the... with the lo- I think I'd made everybody angry. That's a thing I do. Um, so they did not want to, uh, to, to... Yeah, and I did not want to either. Like, we, I'm at loggerheads with my local local establishment all the time. Chris can, uh, yeah, Chris can vouch for that. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it's some, some of that tension is what makes my work different. And um, so I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not ashamed or annoyed about my sort of, I guess, reactive nature to, to you know, creating art. But I was so grateful and so pleased that you were willing to sort of stretch as a publisher and let me do something so experimental with, you know, what is effectively my first launch with your publishing company. So, like, I can't imagine a local Australian publisher, so, like, getting behind that. They probably would be like, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, they wouldn't know how. So I was really grateful that, you know, you were, you as a publishing company and, and as a poet were like, yeah, that sounds interesting. Let's give it a go. So, again... Thank you for that. Uh, I think you answered all of my other questions um, in that one answer, actually, James. So um, <laughs> that's a great, a great answer, really, because um, we went on a few tangents. But um, I've got one more question for Chris and one more uh, question for Elizabeth before we wrap up. Um, unless anybody else is coming up with questions that have been sort of piqued by uh, our discussion. So do feel free to interject. Um, I'll, I'll move on to Chris, if that's all right. You ready, Chris? Fabulous. Okay, so um, what kind of digital medias do you find most exciting or compelling for translating or uh, reimagining live theatre, live music, or other live events? Um, It's been an interesting time for theatre in that theatre practitioners have had to integrate technology in ways that we haven't had to before. The The whole phenomenon of doing readings or performances over Zoom um, or translating a, a show that was meant to be immersive and, and present into uh, an audio, almost an audio tour of the show or, or whatever. Um, so the the possibility of just having technology as a medium for performance I think is is really apparent right now to to rather than have computers backstage you know driving the lighting driving the sound or or whatever the computer becomes the stage itself um or the phone, or, or you know, the, the headset, whatever it is. Um, and theatre makers are kind of having to reckon with what that does to our relationship with audience. You know, we, we have for a long time taken it for granted that audiences will be in a space that is separate from us. It might be in the same room, but... They, but um, one of the kind of philosophical things about performance is that the performance space is delineated and set aside from where the audience space is. Um, now, audiences can be in it in a really different way. Um, so it's that it's it's understanding that potential is exciting. Um, in in the way that we didn't know what television was going to be when it first appeared, that we didn't know what games were going to be when they first appeared. Um, and the fact that the games tools like uh, Unreal Engine are starting to come into particularly uh, TV and film at the moment. But I think soon we're going to see... Um, you know, a, pro- a projected environment, perhaps, which is rendered in in Unreal Engine, but you know, real live performers and real live audiences. Oh, are they're doing that. It. They're yeah. doing that now. They have these massive curved screens and yeah. projectors and whatnot. No, they're absolutely already doing that. I love Unreal Engine. It's fabulous, but I won't nerd on too much about it. 
Well, I, I, I haven't started nerding yet. I've just oh downloaded I can't wait for you to nerd on with me about this, Chris. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, okay, that was a really good answer. I'm going to ask Elizabeth um, a, a similar question. Um, how can digital or mixed reality events empower artists, uh, whether it be to perform, exhibit, or build an immersive experience of any kind that you'd like to speak to? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I, am I now? Am I, am I now? You're good okay, now. Good. I can hear you now. Better. Okay. Good. Okay, we've lost James. <laughs> um, oh, we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Ah, okay. Um, so the question was um, basically empowering the artists through all of these kinds of um, new mediums that are emerging. Yes. And I, I mean, Chris's answer was really great. I just, I was thinking a lot about kind of um, what you alluded to with, um, you know, you have one person or a group of people on a stage and then you have an audience. And I always kind of thought, oh, well, when else can you have, say, a one-on-one -on -one thousand situation and the one person is the one with the power? Usually it's the other way around. But if you are, you know, if, if that is the context, then that is the understanding. And to me, that's where the interest starts because if you're starting with that it's just like oh what is the one person conveying and how is it being received okay so if it's being received now in ways where it's you know on a screen or if it's in this immersive environment that is also digitized in a way then I don't really know what that looks like right now but I'm very interested to find out I just feel like we're at the very beginnings of the kernel of it and man I can't wait I really can't wait and before we like wrap up uh, entirely, I guess I just, and I'm sorry James isn't here, I wanted to say it's such a pleasure to meet Chris and James and see that we all came together so that we could help with this glorious project of yours, Rev. I mean, just the book is extraordinary. I am thrilled with my copy of it. I think everyone should have a copy. It's beautiful work. It's profound work. It's interesting work. It's great. And it was such a joy to get to be able to be a part of doing anything at all to be able to promote it or make it more known in the world. So well, thank look, you for inviting. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. You, your support has uh, been absolutely incredible and it would not have been the project uh, that it, it has become because you just thank you. Thank you a hundred yeah. times and thank you, Chris, a hundred times. And thank you, James, who has call, gone off the call a hundred, hundred times, all of you. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for making all the time to, to come and speak to us, but, uh, for, for me as the artist and the organizer, uh, across this project, I had to stretch and use all of my multidisciplinary skills. I used traditional art, inks and vintage papers, scanned and photographed them for digital manipulation and illustration. I used my background in book and graphic design and traditional filmmaking. I was influenced heavily by my VR use, which created a different use of perspective and space in the 2D or text-based works I was creating for kaleidoscopic erasures. I was very lucky to have a great base of talented friends who, when asked, I have an idea and a set of challenges, what do you think? They all put their hands up to help, and we all worked with what we already had to make something unique and compelling. I'm very proud of these launch events, and I'm so proud of this book. To compare it to a previous pre-COVID book launch in Melbourne, which filled a venue with a capacity of about 80 people, all from the local city area, this VR book launch event had over 100 visitors in the first 48 hours it was live on VR chat, and they all came from different countries and time zones. It remains available as a persistent experience on VR chat, so that means that hopefully even more people will engage with it over time. Check the end of the video for a link where you can go and have a look at these Vispo works in VR yourself if you'd like to. I'll also pop a link to the video guided tour as well at the end of this discussion if you're not yet a VR citizen, but most importantly, get yourself a book. They're available for sale on the Steel Incisors website. Thank you all for tuning in and listening to our discussion. Thanks from the bottom of my heart to James, Elizabeth and Chris for not only collaborating generously and helping make the book a success, but also to coming uh, to discuss it all for the Queensland XR Festival. I hope you have a lovely day or night wherever it is you are in the world.